Hi everyone, uh, welcome. Uh, this evening uh, we will be chatting with Simon Murphy. I'm just going to get a couple of little technical things done and then we'll be with you for an introduction and just let the rest of the people in first of all though. Um, okay, so first of all, um, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Um, really lovely to have you uh, spend your evening with us and um, just a bit of housekeeping. Um, if you want to ask a question or anything like that, just pop it in the chat. Um, at any time, it's kind of informal meeting. Um, anybody's comments or questions are welcome. Uh, but just to save people jumping in at different times and things like that, if you could just pop it in the chat. And although we are on Zoom tonight, it would be fantastic to see your faces. Don't feel like you have to turn your camera on, but it would be nice to kind of have that vibe going on. So, um, yes, yeah, feel free to turn your camera on if you wish to do so. Um, tonight we'll be joined by Simon Murphy. He's going to be um, chatting about um, his project Govan Hill. Um, we're going to um, start off with a, with a bit of a presentation um, by Simon. He's going to introduce his work and things like that. And then afterwards, um, we'll just have a bit of a, a bit of a chat, really. And as I say, you are welcome to kind of um, bring your questions and your comments into that. Just let us know in the chat area if you do want to do so. Um, if you only want to ask the questions via the text, then that's fine. If you do want to come on the camera and stuff, um, more than welcome to do so. We'll be happy to um, hear you and see you. Um, just want to thank Simon um, in advance of starting for joining us tonight as well and um, giving us this opportunity to um, hear about his work and his practice. Um, Govan Hill is a fantastic project and um, it's currently in our exhibition what we like which is on our virtual gallery if anybody does want to go and look at that afterwards if you haven't already um, last thing is we host these talks a few times a month there's a couple coming up uh, next week that we're going to announce and there's one on sunday on diversity and documentary photography if you do want to join um, our mailing list you can keep up to date on all of that stuff and you can join that at our website cubegallery.com um, so without further ado, I just want to introduce Simon into the talk, and um, as long as you're happy with it, Simon, are you okay to just introduce yourself and um, introduce the talk a little bit? Yeah, sure, John. Thanks very much. So first of all, thanks everybody for, for joining tonight. That's brilliant. And thanks to John for having me as part of the exhibition with these fantastic photographers. So it's a real privilege to be part of. Um, my name's Simon Murphy. I'm a photographer. I've been a photographer for about 20 years, or I went to college about 20 years ago and learned to be a photographer. And at that time at college, I was living in a place in the south side of Glasgow called Govan Hill. Um, brilliant place, very, very, it's only, it's about a mile square. And within that area, it's said that there's 88 languages spoken there. So it's a, a hugely diverse area, but I've also heard figures like 66 languages. And today uh, there was a magazine article about uh, Govan Hill and it, was, it said 32 languages. So who knows, but it's, it's very diverse anyway. So back in college, I was living there and just for college assignments, I would be shooting in Govan Hill. Um, then I started getting jobs as a photographer and all that college work didn't really matter anymore. That was almost what was leading up to getting those jobs. And I did something a bit stupid. I threw all my negatives away because I thought I didn't need them. Um, now, of course, that's, that's your archive nowadays, but I just thought, well, that's what I needed to get the jobs. And I started working for the Herald, which is a, a newspaper in Scotland. It was a Saturday magazine I started working for, and that was amazing. It changed my life. Um, even getting outside Glasgow and seeing a bit of, of the country uh, going to other countries, just incredible experience. And photography really did change my whole outlook and my whole world. So uh, after that, I worked for the, the Herald for about six years or so. And my first daughter, I, felt, I got the news that my first daughter was on her way. And at that time, newspapers were really shaky. Um, budgets were going down and down and down and there was always redundancies and I just didn't like the idea of that with this new child on the way so I left and started freelancing thinking I was going to be a superstar you know yeah I'll get all the freelance jobs and and there just wasn't those jobs in Glasgow really um, 
So I had a choice to make, do I go to London or do I stay in Glasgow? But I wanted to stay in Glasgow, bring up my, my girl, uh, and now my girls in Glasgow, and that's what I did. So I started teaching, um, wh which was brilliant. Um, my lecturer, Christine Stevenson, who I think is on tonight, uh, offered me a job. He said, do you want to come in and teach in the college? And that was tremendous. And just a kind of steady wage while I could do my own project. So it was brilliant, but there's always this hunger to shoot. You know, it's okay speaking about photography, but it's better to do it. And if the students see you doing it, well, that means something to them. So I needed a project. And that's when I went back to my project, Govan Hill. And that was, what, 15 years after I started shooting it. Um, and so I started again, I've got my diary here, this is my, my journal, and Wednesday the 26th of September, oh no, Wednesday the 21st of September, um, I've lived here from the age of 20 to the age of 36, lots of good memories, good nights and good days, anything can happen and often does in Govan Hill. In recent days, I felt the desire to return. And so that's what I've been doing since then, just shooting in Govan Hill. My project's about, it is about diversity. That's that's the underlying message. Um, it's something that I love, I'm drawn to. Um, and Govan Hill, if you want to see diversity, if that moves you, then that's the place to come if you're ever visiting Glasgow. So what I thought I'd do is share some images from the project, just to let you see what I've been up to. And also to just give you a little bit of background about what I do. And then we can just have a chat, open it to questions, anything you want to know, by all means, just, just fire the questions in. So just give me a wee moment, I'll try and share this. Okay, so just give me a wee nod, if you can see my name there nice and and bold. Yeah, oh, that's good. Wonderful. So this is a kind of brief overview of, of what I've done. Um, this image was an image that I photographed in, I'm just going to, sorry, just let someone in. So going back to that image, this was an image that I photographed when I was in college. So what I would do, I would, Christine showed me pictures of Henri Cartier-Bresson pictures and jean Lucif, and I would just love those images and I thought Paris is where to go and so I used to get the bus to Paris and it was about 50 quid return um, it was a night bus and I'd go to Paris and I'd, I'd live, I had no money but I'd just find really really cheap hotels and um, stay in Paris I remember one hotel actually I think it was this trip my French is terrible and so I went into this hotel and I explained that I'd like a, a room and I went up to the room and it had the most beautiful view of the kind of Parisian rooftops, but I turned round and in my bed, something was moving. And this was the red light district of Paris, by the way, right? And there's something moving in my bed and I thought, what is that? And I turned round and a wheat, that's a Scottish word, a wheat, the covers off and there's this cat and I've never seen a cat like it. Its eyeballs were hanging out. It was, it was a manji cat. And I ran downstairs and I said to the concierge, I said, um, remember my French is terrible, un chat in my chambre. And he just he looked at me and just gave me my money back and sent me packing. So I stayed, I stayed in very cheap hotels and just wandering. And the notion of Paris, about this great place to photograph and this, the reality was quite different. When I went, it was always bleak, it was always dull, it was raining, it was as bad as Glasgow. And I would wander about to see nothing. And I passed this bar and in the corner of my eye, I saw this woman sitting in the bar. And of course I walked by, how could I go, how could I photograph her? You know, I was a student, I had this idea of being a photographer, but I wasn't a photographer. And I felt so nervous in my stomach, but then I thought to myself, well, I'm in Paris, what am I here for? I'm here to photograph, I need to. So I forced myself to go back and I went into the bar and I, I ordered a beer, because I know the French for that, une bière, s'il vous plaît. And I ordered a beer and I got the beer and I sat my camera down on the bar, which was a medium format camera, film camera. And you can look down upon it. So it was really good. And I would just wait, I wound and clunk, 
the shutter went and everybody in the bar looked up. So I kind of picked up the camera, put it to my ear, shook it, you know, the universal line, ah, it's not working, not working. I put it back down and I made another exposure. And this image, the minute I took it, I knew in my gut that I had something special. And of course, I couldn't see it until I got back to Glasgow and I processed it. But this image is so important to me. Um, I'm just going to let some more people in, sorry. Uh, admit all. There we go. So this image, this image is so important to me because when I see it, it reminds me that, you know, if you are feeling that fear, like we do as photographers, and this would apply to lots of aspects of life, you know, we all fear, we all feel fear at different times, but photographers, I think more so, uh, street photographers, um, there's always that moment, should I, should I, should I not? Will I bring the camera out? Will I not? And I've always found that if you just step over that barrier, that boundary of fear, great things happen. And this image always reminds me of that. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to flick through some of the images and go into the Govan Hill project. Uh, I'll show you these first, if I can. Okay, so through when I started working for the Herald, I managed to travel. And to get to countries, this was Tanzania. This was the first time I'd been to Africa. It was just incredible. I'll never forget the smells, the heat when, opened the, when the door of the plane opened. And it was, it was just brilliant. And this was... I've got stories behind every image, but I'll, I'll not tell you them all. But if you want to know any of the stories, we can go back to it. But this was a day that I spent with a guy who called himself King George that I found in a bar. And we just went around Tanzania drinking beer. And I photographed this image. Herald gave me opportunities to photograph artists, um, writers, musicians and that, that was wonderful so this was a portrait of John Byrne something else photography gave me this is, this is my girls this is Biba and Lola but it gave me it was an incredible moment when photography actually allowed me to pay for a holiday abroad with my girls where it actually provided that and and so this image again is is important to me because of that actually making it work as a a, a means to make a living Love music, love Primal Scream, love Screamadelica, the album, one of the best albums of all time. So getting to photograph musicians, this is Bobby Gillespie. This was another trip to the Congo. Sometimes the, the stories, I share a lot of human interest stories and those stories are pretty tough. And this is a portrait from the Congo and it was a really, really tough, uh, tough story. Um, so I haven't done any of these jobs for a while. Um, since COVID, but hopefully I'll return. Um, and this is closer to home, this is Glasgow. But again, starting to focus away from when I left the Herald, I stopped photographing well-known people and turned my camera to people who I meet in the street. And that kind of led back into the Govan Hill project. Uh, so this is Gary. So into Govan Hill, what I'll do is I'll flick through the images. There's a couple of new ones in there. Some of you may have seen on my Instagram. So this is a week or two ago. This is Mark Paisley. This is Danny. So all of these images are taken as chance encounters. So I see people in, in the street in Govan Hill. I, I walk. I just wander quite slowly and I see people and there has to be something about that individual that excites me, you know, that I see whether it's a coat that they're wearing or the way they've styled their hair and I'll ask them, I'll, well, usually I tell them what it is that, that I've seen and I ask if, if I can photograph them and that's, that's my process, that's how it works. Sometimes, um, I've tried to arrange shoots and I've not, I found that it does, just doesn't work the same. It, it turns into more of a commission, the feel of it. You know, I feel that I have to produce more images rather than just the one portrait. But occasionally I'll do that, but more often than not, it's just wandering, meeting people, talking to them and asking if I can photograph them.
a lot of my por portraits are quite serious, you know, staring down the camera, cigarette in hand. So um, this one's a little bit lighter. This is a, a newspaper that I produced called Govan Hill. So I wanted, Govan Hill, over the years, I've lived there for a long time. Um, I'm just going to let a couple more in. Just do that there. So I've lived in Govan Hill for for a long time, and Govan Hill has had quite a bad reputation over the years. Um, even recently, there's been stories coming out, and I've never found Govan Hill to be that place that that I hear these stories of. So I had an idea of producing this newspaper, and I produced a hundred of them. This is one here. So this is issue three and there's a hundred of these papers and I pay for it myself and I number them and assign them and I drop them off in different shops and cafes in Govan Hill. And the idea is that people will come into Govan Hill if, if they really want one of those papers, photographers, people like that, if they want one, they'll have to come into Govan Hill to get it. And by doing that, it might change perceptions of the place or maybe they'll contribute a little bit to the economy even if it's buying a coffee, you know, that's enough. And so that was the idea of the newspaper. And so there's a hundred of them and I'm on, I'm going to do another couple of them. Let me just get back to the slideshow. This is, most of my portraits I shoot in medium format and it's quite a different approach to shooting 35 mil, but I do shoot 35 mil as well. So these are some of the images, the looser images. I find them harder. Uh, I'm not a great photographer for seeing the moment and capturing it quickly. M most of my portraits are quite um, controlled. Uh, so these are some of the, the looser shots. That was just last week. Here's some more portraits. And that's the the most recent portrait. I just shot that um, last week as well. Just got, got the next back. So that is that. So I'm going to stop sharing this. There we go. So that's the project. What do you want to know about it? Have you got any questions? So John's going to take over and we will just get a conversation going. But, but like John said, any questions at all, fire them in the chat and, and we'll just make it nice and loose and easy. Yeah, it would be yeah. nice to hear um, everyone's kind of contributions and things like that throughout. But um, I was just thinking there and when you were chatting and um, when you were saying you're still shooting the other day and things like that, like how many of these have you actually processed now? And like, how, how much further do you, do you see it going? Well, I, st I kind of restarted. I've got a couple of negs from the, when I first, when I was at college. Um, I've still got some portraits, but... Since 2016, I've been shooting and I shoot most weeks. So I don't know how many people have photographed, but at least 100, maybe 200, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but it's definitely intensified. Uh, I had an exhibition last, last year uh, with Street Level. And the idea was we're going to have an exhibition in the, in the gallery and COVID hit and so I had always been doing little exhibitions anyway. I remember doing an exhibition in the baths and there was a, a chap I had photographed called Scott. He's all tattooed and he just, his shop was just around the corner and I had invited him to this exhibition at the baths, uh, the Govan Hill swimming baths and it was free drink, you know, and he didn't come. And I thought, why did he not come? You know, because it was a massive print of him. And what I realized is that exhibitions for many can be a little bit intimidating. 
if they haven't been before. And even just popping around to that was difficult for Scott. And so what I decided to do was just take prints and put them up in walls down in Govan Hill, bring the work back to the community. And so that's what I did. And then when we couldn't have the exhibition, we did the same, but instead with the street level exhibition, we put the images, 20 images in shop windows around Govan Hill. So to see them, you had to do a bit of a trail uh, and again, experience Govan Hill. So it's all about experiencing the community. So in terms of roles of film, I just sent about eight roles away today or yesterday. So I've, usually every week I've got about eight rolls of film to send. But an interesting point about like folk not coming to exhibitions and things like that when um it's a bit off key or whatever. But uh just with the show at the minute, uh, what we like and stuff, it's in the virtual gallery. And that was like a kind of a big motivation of mine was because there is quite a big boundary between the pavement and going a gallery, isn't there? For folk it's, it's a scary place. It can be. I mean even you know the opening nights you get the wee glass of wine it always tastes like vinegar mm -hmm. and if you're just not used to that even holding that glass you kind of feel a bit uncomfortable you know how do i hold it Aye. Um, like approaching the bar area and you're not sure whether you have to pay and it's very confusing it's, for yeah yeah it is and so i, I think there's totally, absolutely a place for traditional galleries because i mean I just love it to see your work presented, beautifully printed, framed, and big white walls is great. But I think to find other ways, like Street Level did then, like I, I did and like you've done with the virtual ga gallery, I think that's a good thing that's come out of, of lockdown, just being innovative. There's a few questions in the chat here, so I'll just put them to you. Um, so um, Alan says that he, along with Dodger, um, if you know who Dodge is, um, really enjoyed the shop window show last year. Um, but his question is, uh, do you only shoot in film or do you shoot digitally as well? So for, for this project, I shoot in film and it's not because I think film's better than digital. Um, I shoot in a medium format camera, which you can get digital back for. But I think it's about 30 grand, so I, I don't have the money. Um, although I've probably spent that in film, but it's just it's bit by bit by bit. So... <laughs> You kind of it's easier to hide um so yes i shoot this project film and the reason is because i started it in film and i'm a bit like that when i start a project in a certain way i just like to continue it but for any commissions that i do um or for other projects i shoot digitally as well brilliant um so another question here from paul Sargent. um how did the photos go from a lot of shots into becoming a body of work and is it is having a body of work important? I actually really like that second question there, if, if you don't mind chatting a bit about that more. Yeah, what was the first one? The, um, the... How did it transform from being a lot of pictures, basically, into becoming what you've seen as a, as a body of work? Um, I, I don't know, that's a good question. It, I mean, obviously, when I started it, we, we couldn't, it couldn't be termed as a body of work, but I think in my mind, it, it always was. And, it's funny because I've always had a problem with projects that they never seem to end. I can't find a cutoff date for a project because, like for instance, Govan Hill, I could go down tomorrow and shoot a great portrait. And so if I had brought, brought out a book yesterday, do you know, it's like, oh no, you know? So I, I had to start thinking about the way I shoot my projects in a different way. And I started thinking about my projects like books and how a book has chapters. And I thought, well, instead of having just a whole project or a whole body of work, let's make chapters. And so when I did the first exhibition in the Govan Hill Baths, that was like chapter one. Um, and it was only 10 images. But at that point, that was a body of work, although it was only 10 images. Uh, when I brought out my paper, the first paper, that was chapter two. And so I see it in that sense where it's a body of work just now, but the final body of work will it ever be completed i don't know um i yeah. think what's interesting about that as well is um i think we spoke a bit about that but for those who aren't from the area or from the wider area or aren't familiar with the area and i'm not overly familiar with the area but there is a certain level of gentrification that's going on there isn't there at the moment and that there's a big um, influx of people moving in and cafes popping up around about the govan hill shawlands area that kind of 
uh, locale. Um, so I suppose it's kind of, in a sense, capturing the evolution of the people physically present there, isn't it? So it really shouldn't end any yeah. time or whatever. And it, I take responsibility for that. I think everybody's moving in because I've made it super cool. You've rebranded the area. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's, you said something there that's quite interesting about, so Govan Hill as an area has always been a starting point. And it's always been a place for immigrants. And so when I lived there first time around 20 years ago, but even before that, you know, my grandma lived in Govan Hill, my dad grew up in Govan Hill. So it was, a, it was very Irish and then had a very Asian side as well. It was, it was, people would joke, it's, it's Bengal and Donegal. So it's always been a place for, for different cultures and that's continued. Um, so it is really interesting to see how it changes. It's, and it's not something, I think some, some people are, get a little bit annoyed because you're talking about gentrification and also it's, you used a great word you, before you said it's, it's quite bohemian. And when you said that, it kind of, I thought, yeah, that's what it is. It, it's quite bohemian. But I love that because it's just, it's following the pattern that in my experience, Govan Hill has always had, and that is change all the time, all the time. And it's really interesting to document that. And it makes it a goldmine for photography, you know, looking at it from a photographer's point of view. Um, you don't want to photograph something that's the same all the time. So if, if a place is always changing, Day by day, I'll see different things that I'll see in a different way. Well, there was a second part to the question before, John. What was that? There was. Let me just scroll back up. Um, is it important to have a body of work? I think it helps. I think a body of work helps it, rather than just single images. Um, I think especially if you're wanting articles written about it or if, if you're wanting to make a deeper point, you know, more of a documentary story. I think it's quite important. But then some single images are so powerful, aren't they, that that's enough. Because yeah. that's something I struggle with sometimes, thinking and being a photographer, making work as well, is um, almost every other medium of creation doesn't require hundreds or dozens of versions of it to be validated, but often in photography it does. But do you think it is that to a point necessary um, in this kind of this kind of work? Or I think I think to keep people interested, you've mm. got to produce new work. Um, but you're working for the newspapers. The saying was always, "You're only as good as your last photograph." Mm. And, and there's also the idea that like tomorrow, your photography is chip paper. You know, you go into the chippy and someone would, you'd wrap your chips in it. So there's always that idea where you've got to be producing new work all the time uh, in photography. And at some point then you can look back, but I just don't think, I think especially with the social media, um, there's almost an expectation. It, it becomes like, social media becomes like a commission, someone commission you, and no one's paying you. And- um, Real time it, gig, that's for sure, isn't it? It's yeah. Totally. And you've got to keep producing to, to I suppose, satisfy. Mm -hmm. but it's a good thing as well, because, Sometimes that gives you a bit of a drive. Um, not that I do it for social media, but um, I definitely don't mind the motivation that it gives me. Yeah, I was actually just thinking about that earlier. I was out on a walk and um, just thinking about how it is a double-edged sword. I mean, even tonight and being able to bring everyone together and communicate this event to everybody um, in all different places and things like that. It's um, it's an amazing thing, isn't it? But as you say, it does kind of in a sense, put a, put a pressure on um, to keep on creating in a certain kind of way um, to dodge algorithms and all, and all sorts of weird stuff. But um, Scott's asked, um, do you ask permission for the looser shots? So I'm assuming, uh, Scott, uh, by looser shots, you mean like um, less intense portraits or less planned portraits. Would, would that be right? I don't know if you want to jump on or... Yeah, just the uh, 35 mil stuff. I, I noticed that um, there's a lot of kids involved and I was just wondering uh, if uh, you um, asked permission, maybe not at the time, but maybe afterwards and how that, that came about. I, um, really inspired by your work. So I was just wondering. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, so, so the, with the portraits, 
clearly I've got to ask, you know, and, and I make that approach. I've never been good. There's some terrific photographers that are on here tonight that just are able to capture that moment really quickly. And the exhibition itself, you'll see a lot of that. I'm not that good at that. And more often than not, even if depends, you know, I, I think the answer is it depends. Um, for some, for instance, there's a, a little boy with a shotgun. Um, so that's maybe a good example because it's, you're talking about kids as well. So I saw that little boy going into um, walk, carrying a shotgun and, and going into a shop. And the shop was his dad's shop. And it, at the time, it was it was a beautician's shop, but it also doubled as a butcher's. OK, only in Govan Hill, you get that. Um, so I thought, wow, that's a great shop. Um, and so in that instance, I had I went in and I asked the father um, if I could photograph the boy and he agreed and we went out. So it wasn't a shot of the moment. So there's a bit of can setting up, there's a bit of control in there, but that's how I get around that. So there are shots like that. There's other shots that, that don't need permission that are more anonymous. So for instance, just, just grabbing this, um, there was a shot in front of this Governor Hill paper. It's someone's back. Um, standing in the snow, so no, I, I, I wouldn't ask permission for that, and I, I wouldn't even go up to them afterwards and and ask if that was okay. Um, so it, the answer is, Scott, it depends just on the circumstance, but with kids, nowadays, by law, I wouldn't have to, but even if I see kids in the street and I would like to do a portrait, I'll speak to them and ask where their parents are, and I'll ask the parents first, and I always send images back. I get email addresses, um, physical addresses. Sometimes I take prints round to the individuals. That's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, that's really helpful and useful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. So just to clarify on that, because I think it's quite an important point for anybody who's practicing and doesn't really know how to approach this situation is what if um, there, is no, there is no guardian or parent around and things like that, do you just not shoot it then? Yeah, I've, I've not been in, in that circumstance. Um, actually, that's not true. There's one shot that I showed four boys uh, on a bike, and I did photograph that, and there was no guardian around. Um, so, you know, I think back to some of the, the great street shots um, in history. I even think back to Oscar Mazzaroli's Glasgow shots, you know, and times have changed, and we've got to be really, really sensitive so more often than not, I would. Um, I'm quite well known in Govan Hill, and Govan Hill's it's so small that a parent, it, it's really easy for me to to get hold of a parent. You know, it's really, really easy. So that's what I do. Um, because I just don't want to. It's a project about the community, and I want the community to enjoy the project and I want them to to value it and be proud of it as well. So I, I just don't want to be sneaky about anything. Enough. And um, Michelle McLean uh, just wanted to say, amazing, pro amazing project. I love seeing the progress of the new images. And um, Stephen has asked, relating to your work abroad, how do you feel things have changed, if at all, for photographers compared to how it used to be? Going abroad? Uh, I don't know. I've not been abroad for a year, so I don't know. Um... Do you just mean, uh, Stephen, in relation to uh, shooting abroad and um, shooting people from different cultures and, and that kind of thing? You with us? Yes, this is um, how it's changed in relation to just shooting abroad and, and being there and, and things yeah, like that. Yeah, well, I mean, there's, there's kind of two ways to do it. So if you're going abroad yourself for a personal project, um, I would just approach that the same way I would shoot in Govan Hill. You know, I just wander and, and photograph. Um, but commissions abroad are, are different. And especially those jobs that are in countries like Colombia, Bangladesh, sometimes I'm going to refugee camps and places like that. So all of that's organized by NGOs, charities, and there's code of conduct to follow that we've got to sign up to lots of forms that we've got to fill in and you're really kind of directed um by those what we call partners um out in the field when you're out so it's i that's always been i've been shooting abroad for 
the best part of 15 years and it's it's not really changed i've not really found a difference in the the way that we do it um sorry i don't know if that's that's too helpful that answer but I, i've not really found much difference are you expecting um that kind of culture of going abroad to work uh, to come back relatively soon or what do you think will happen i don't know i, th I think it's a kind of government thing isn't it with covid passports and um i, I just don't know um mm -hmm. hopefully okay uh john masson um says that uh, through your Govan Hill work, you have um, helped open his eyes to documentary. So that's a quite the compliment there, Simon. Thank you so much, John. And, appreciate that. Um, Duncan said it's inspiring work. How do you go about sequencing the work into the newspaper and getting the work out there? Yeah, so sequencing it, um, I have very, very loose themes for the paper. So number three, which is the one that I've been holding up, is it's all based around the young team. So it is, there's a lot of youth in, in this one, so it's, it's about Govan Hill's youth. But I tend not to put too much text in it, although this time around, there's a, a chap called Peter Mohan who, who writes a blog in Govan Hill and I asked him to write a little thing, a little piece for it, it's really nice. But this one here was all based around um, youth, whereas the first issue was just trying to make it as diverse as possible, the first one, in terms of age groups, culture and um, just to kind of set the marker the tone for it the second one had a loose theme of love and when i say that it's it's so loose you know um like for instance i think there's a shot of a skateboarder and on his trousers it says supreme and so i think is it a duke ellington song or something like that there's you know so there's we we clues in there um that help me formulate it um and bring it into these chapters and eventually these chapters might keep the same form if it becomes a book. Cool. Um, Malcolm uh, Dixon's made quite a good point here, just saying, um, I think going back to the earlier thing of um, how you approach taking the pictures in the area and stuff like that, and um, he was saying that you've in many ways become ubiquitous with Govan Hill and kind of really integrated yourself in the area. And I suppose um, what you mentioned before, always having your camera present and um, been really respectful in regards to making sure everyone has permission where necessary. Um, do you think that's had a lot to do with that, just kind of building up that respect over a long period of time? Yeah, the camera thing, I was I was talking to I think John Bolleton, so I'm just now, we were sending a few messages last night and um, we we're talking about that and having the big camera, you know, on show, sometimes it's, there's a photographer that's, that walks around Govan Hill, he, he walks around with the camera just on shoot, just to let people see that he's got a camera, the hands behind his back, you know, and that's not the reason I carry a camera about visibly. I just feel that showing the camera, there's no doubt in people's minds what it is that I'm doing. Um, I don't want people to think that I'm sneaky or I'm embarrassed about what I do. And I, I used an analogy when we had the opening night and it, was, it wasn't very good, but I spoke about a, a binman, but actually it's, it's a street sweeper that I'm in. And when you see a street sweeper, you see him with a brush and you don't go up to him and question why he's got a brush. You know, that's what he does. And no doubt he's proud of it, you know. And likewise with photography, my camera's in show. A couple of reasons. One, it's quite big, so it's hard to set up because sometimes these interactions are five minutes or less. But I want people to know what I do. Um, I'm not ashamed of what I do. I'm, I'm proud of what I do. And... I think that takes away that kind of idea of, I think sometimes photographers get a, reput a strange reputation, you know, about being sneaky and all that. I, and saying that, you know, sometimes the best shots of the moment are done when you can just quickly pull a camera out and pull away, but it's just not my type of photography. I'm just not very good at that. Um, so that's why I walk around with a big tripod, big medium format camera and, like Malcolm says, people know me now, which is good because they can run. If, if they don't want to see me, they can they see me from a mile off. So they can just whoosh, run the other direction. Do you ever but get often, hassle for folks? Hassle? No, I, not really. I get one of the hardest things is people that I don't really want to photograph asking me to photograph them. Mm. And because film's expensive and the young team are the worst because I try and explain 
what I'm doing, that will take three weeks before I see the pictures. And the very next day, I'll get a message saying, Where's, where's our images? We want our images. And they want, so you send one and, oh, where's the rest? We want, they want to see all the, the rubbish ones as well. You know, they just want everything. And I think that's kind of just being young, you're kind of used to, it's cheap, isn't it? Photography, it's on call. Uh, so that's, that's the only kind of problem that I have sometimes people mm. asking me to photograph them where I just don't feel it at that moment. That reminds me, I used to, um, when I was a student, uh, photograph club nights. In Edinburgh, yeah. that's is exactly what that was like. I've done that as well. Ah, it's not good, is it? <laughs> it's all the drunk guys. Oh, take a picture of me. Take a picture, and and you kind of have to do it, don't you? You have to do it. I would always... message you the next day as well. Um, <laughs> exact same thing. Um, Chris Henderson's asked. Um, this is this is a boring geeky question. I think it's a very valid question. Uh, which film stock do you shoot on? I uh, used to shoot on Kodak Tri-X, Um because it's beautiful, but it's too expensive now. So I shoot on Ilford HP5, just because uh, it's 400 speed film, which I'm glad I, sh I shoot a lot in the shade, um, just to keep a consistency in my pictures. So uh, Glasgow in the shade can be quite dull and dark. So 400 speed film, um, HP5. Brilliant. Um... John, uh, John Bolton um, has asked, um, are you going to make a book, plans in the pipeline or anything like that? Well, John, John's a great one for books. So he's, I mean, he's got books out already. Um, I would love, I would love to have a book, but I'm not ready for it yet. Um, it needs a bit of time. I feel I need to, I've been shooting this, the way I see it, 2016 to now, what's that? About five years or so. Yeah. Um, with a couple from way back, I, I feel I need a, a longer period of time to do the project justice. So in the interim, I'll just keep having street exhibitions, um, producing my paper. Um, but I'm not quite there for a book. But that definitely, John, that is the that that's the dream to have a book. Right. Uh, John is also in the uh, what we like exhibition. Should give us a wee shout out there. Thanks for joining us tonight, John. So John's work, everybody check out John's work. I love John's work. Um, we, we connected before this mm -hmm. exhibition just through social media. I've seen John's work. And John, I'm, I would be dead interested to hear. Is John on? Is he? Yeah, he's here, yeah. Because I'd like to hear about John's approach because he shoots some of the grittiest, um, most powerful images that I've seen. And, and it's a very different approach. And I know I'm talking just now, but... John, are you up for just telling us a little bit about your approach? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, different approaches, really, because mainly I cut my teeth as a street photographer, so I learned to work very, very quickly. But I think in a similar way to you, Simon, when I was shooting portraits on the street, I like to do it very quickly and kind of do it from the gut, you know, often just to take one picture. I might take it a few times, but you know, just the the one might take two or three, you know, in case somebody's blinking or whatever. But um, I got more into documentary work, mainly around sort of subcultures and groups of people, in particular with Class A drug users and homeless people, which is coming out as a book in September. So the approach with, with that was quite dif different, really, because it was beyond street level. So I had to make those contacts and connect with people in order to go much, you know, into much more deeper private scenes. But my approach kind of is, is the same in many ways. I like to work fairly quickly and spontaneously, but at the same time, think a lot about composition of images and, you know, try and work with layers and things like that if I can. But the primary thing is to have powerful images. Yeah, you know yeah. that are well well composed and everything i mean what i really love about your work is it's grassroots people it's ordinary people and that's kind of at the heart of what i do as well i'm very really interested in ordinary people and there's not enough there's not enough of that in the uk i think so more power to you and anybody else who's who's kind of doing that really but everything is a process isn't it and you've got to kind of i think the main thing is you've got to find yourself mm -hmm find what you do, find your, 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 your own 
character, your own unique place, your own identity. And once you kind of feel, yeah, you've, you've got that, then it's a question of wherever you want to go after that. Yeah, I'd agree. I, I think you've really got to play for the reasons you want to do it. And I was thinking about it the other day because, I mean, I've not had much criticism levelled at me about this project, but sometimes there's one or two, you know, kind of little comments that, that make you think. And I was kind of thinking of a little bit like a marriage, you know, so for me, Govan Hill, I do get something out of this project, you know, and I think, well, is that wrong? You know, it fulfills a, an artistic need in me. Um, but that's like a marriage, you know, you, you meet your partner, you meet a partner and there's something that attracts you to that person. But through time, you know, it's, it's a partnership. And that's, I, I, maybe that's a strange way of talking about it, but that's how I see Govan Hill, you know, and I, I hope that my project gives something back to the community in a way that's not just a plaster. I hope, you know, photography is a very powerful thing. It can trigger thoughts for change. And I think that that's happening um, in some instances. You know, an example I had, a head teacher got in touch with me and she was talking to one of her students and he's really shy, his pupils, I should say, really shy, wasn't really, and it was, it was an issue they had to talk about. And she saw the picture, he was in my exhibition and she started speaking about the image and he, she said it just opened up and he said the power of that photograph, you have no idea the difference that made to me as a head teacher. So I think photography has a massive, massive power and just I think that um, to give something back in some kind of way is important. So thinking about the reason you do it is, is crucial. Yeah, I think um, just picking up on that as well, um... It is obviously a symbiotic relationship if you've been there so long, you know, and you benefit from it, from your career and reputation, all that kind of stuff and producing yeah. the images. But I think um, a big part of the reason, me personally, and I don't know if other people feel this way, the reason I'm a big fan of this work and the same for yourself, actually, John, is that um, I think there's been a real habit and a real culture in documentary photography, photography generally, uh, but particularly in the UK and particularly in places like Glasgow, or Bradford for yourself, John, where um, people want to make it look really sad all the time and make the people look really sad. And um, that's what people and, say about my stuff. <laughs> to make it, I actually thought that it was quite the opposite. It's like you're looking at subcultures and for yourself a place in Govan Hill, and um, you're not you're not pitying them or feeling sorry for them. You're just looking at their life, and in your sense, is especially Simon kind of making heroes out of them. I mean, the picture of Paisley, you know, she's like hero pose and all that kind of stuff and it's um that's that was my personal opinion so I just wanted to get yeah. in there well it's interesting that is an interesting point because even the way I photograph with that camera I know cameras are a boring subject but the medium format camera you look down on it and so it has to be below it has to be not quite waist level but below so everybody I photograph is above me and I see them that way, metaphorically as well, they're above me. You know, I'm looking up to these people and I do see them as heroes. You know, I, I do see them as um, ordinary working class heroes. And that most of my portraits have a direct stare as well. And that's that there's reason to that because I want, when you walk around, right, fear fear's a big problem, you know, in society, you know, and when you're growing up and a lot of people walk about with their heads down. When I'm walking about Govan Hill, my head's up and I'm smiling at people. It took me a long time to learn to smile. If any of my friends are on here, they'll know that, you know, but I'm smiling at people. But I photograph people, direct eye contact, because you don't often do that just when you're walking about the street. And I want people to look at these individuals and to have them stare straight back and say, you know, we're not so different. You know, no matter the culture, age, uh, race, you know, you, we're the same, we've got the same problems. But actually, we've got the same celebrations as well. That is, it's not to be all doom and gloom. That's a great point. And um, as I say, I think that is the strength in the project, really. I mean, you make beautiful images, but um, that kind of undertone is, in my opinion, at least, what makes exactly. it so great. And as I say for yourself, uh, you too, John, I thought the, the delicate nature of your work as well, when you're dealing with such gritty subjects, is exactly the same. Um, Stephen Kay has asked uh, how has the documentary approach informed your commissioned work uh, do you still shoot for corporate advertising clients oh, not at all um, but, but the reason that 
the main reason for that is I teach photography in a college. So that's um, actually been amazing for me because it's allowed me not to focus on making money from photography. So I can purely focus on my own projects and whether that turns into something or not, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me at all. So occasionally I'll, I'll shoot portraits. Um, I did one, a shot today, like a, a, a composer um, for his, whatever he needs it for, his PR or whatever, but um, it's not really had much of an influence. I don't get, I don't get many commissions. I don't advertise for commissions because I just don't have much time to do it. I want to be down in Govan Hill. Um, and I don't want people to influence what I do either. Uh, the beautiful thing about projects like self-initiated projects is that you do it your way. Nobody else has a say. Um, so that's important to me that nobody tries to influence what I'm doing. You should go and photograph this person or you should do this. You know, I, I don't want that. I've um, got a few questions here. So I'm going to, um, I've just been reading through them uh, just to kind of see uh, how we can get them in. Um, so one that I uh, seen that you mentioned in the video I watched it you earlier um, was how did you get into photography? Because I thought that was quite an interesting story and just um, a nice, a nice kind of introduction into it. Yeah. So growing up in Glasgow, um, didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. Didn't know you had choices. I thought if you got a good job, you were just lucky. I, I thought you fell into things. I had no idea. And I just kind of took jobs that fell in front of me. And one of the jobs that I got was a postman. And that was a brilliant job because it gave me time to think. And there's not many jobs where you get time just to walk around and let your mind wander. So I was a postman and I would deliver pictures, postcards. And I remember one of those postcards had a picture of the Beatles sitting on the stairs of Abbey Road. And I always loved that time period in terms of music. And it dawned on me, you know, I thought to myself, I'd love to be there with the Beatles. And it dawned on me that someone else was there, but you never see that person. It's the photographer that's experienced all of those moments, the Stones, the Beatles, the Who, whoever. And I just, it just put that little thought in my mind that that's a job, that's something that you can do. And so another day, the boss of the post had a special presentation for a chap called Wally Brun, and it was a tie. He was getting presented with a tie because he'd been there for 15 years. And I thought to myself, right, 15 years for a tie. What can I do before I get that tie? So I decided that was the moment to, to leave. And I went up to the college in Glasgow, the main college in Glasgow, which at the time was called um, Glasgow College of Building and Printing. And I couldn't get, I never got in because I never had a portfolio. I went to the interview, I never got in. Uh, but then I went to... North Glasgow College uh, and my lecturer, my hero, Christine Stevenson, offered me a place and changed, changed my life. So that, that's how I got into photography. But then, of course, after that, you need to study, you need to work hard and you need to take opportunities because there's opportunities in front of you all the time. And it, it's just like taking pictures. You know, do you walk by? It's like that Paris woman. Do you walk by or do you go back and do you grab that opportunity? And I kind of, that image in Paris always kind of makes me think about no I've got to take this chance whatever it is and so that happened with going to college but it's happened with jobs as well. And I think as well just going back to it not to lay on the point too much but you kicking about somewhere like Govan Hill and things like that with your camera and very visibly making a career out of it I'm sure that that lets lots of people in the area know that that's an option for them now so well in for that. Uh, do you ever, uh, Del Boy um, has asked do you ever think you'll leave Govan Hill or the surrounding area? Del knows I don't stay in Govan Hill anymore. <laughs> but in terms of, if he means um, as a project, no, I don't. I think I'm going to be kicking about there um, for a long, long time. I'm, I'm there all the time, but actually I don't live in Govan Hill anymore. I've, I've lived there on and off and I've had connections there for the past 20 or more years. But I stay about 10 minutes up the road. I've got a wee garden now for the girls, you know, and that's that's what happens. Well, it happened to me when I thought we'll move and get a wee garden. I mean, and would you, um, just based on a question that Neve asked, um, would you um, exhibit the pictures in the actual community again, like out in the walls? And yeah, stuff? yeah. Um, hopefully that will happen again. We're 
I'm, I'm talking to Malcolm, who's on tonight um, from st Street Level, and we're talking about doing a Govan Hill 2 exhibition. Sounds like a movie, Jaws 2. Um, so we're going to do that in August, and again, it will be a photo trail. It's a little bit more pressure, It's because I had about four years to build up to those images that were displayed last August, and now this has got to be new work, so it's like a difficult second album. It's got, it's got to be good. Uh, so that's why anyone in government probably sees me out shooting all the time because I've got a bit of pressure on now. You have to outdo yourself. Yeah. yeah. Um, bit of a technical question, but um, it is, I suppose, quite important in terms of how uniform your pictures are sometimes. Is there a specific time of day that you'll only shoot in? No, uh, no. Like well, I don't really shoot at night time um, just because there's not much light. Um, that's the main reason, you know, and I'm shooting 400 film, which is quite fast film, but it's not fast compared to what ISOs can go up to in digital cameras for night shots. So generally I shoot during the day between the hours of maybe 10 and 7 at night, just depending on how long the light goes on for. But I do shoot in the shade uh, most of the time, and I think that gives the portraits that same feel. Um, so there is a kind of... Um, consistency to the way I approach it and if I meet someone and they're standing in bright sunlight that might work but I might just ask if we can move to a doorway it's always somewhere very very close by um because that's what's when I see the individual they maybe spark something in me but sometimes it's it's where they're standing as well you know it's the whole scene that makes the, the kind of image so I don't want to change that so although there is control in a different way to some of the street photography that you have um, exhibited, um, it's all kind of, it's quite organic as well. It's like sometimes five minutes less than that I take to do it. Right. And uh, just going back to the, your kind of story about college before, sorry for chopping and changing, um, but see when you were at college, is that what prompted this project to start being made? What was it that kind of made you think, oh, this is how I'm going to get involved in doing this Governor Hill project? Um, yeah, so in college, you're always issued with different briefs. So I remember one of the briefs was a portraiture brief. And I thought, I got what hula photograph, you know, and there was a boxing gym around the corner from me. And this boxing gym is still there. It's called the Kelvin, Glass Kelvin ABC or something. And it's like Mickey's gym from Rocky. It smells of damp. It's fantastic, you know, and... There was, I went and chapped the door and I asked, and there was a trainer there called Charlie Kerr. And Charlie was a, I don't know if he was a heavyweight, but he was a professional boxer in his time, but way back. And he won a sheep, one of his purse was a sheep. You know, so this is back, I don't know, 50s, I don't know when it was. Anyway, that's a true story, right? So Charlie Kerr, I photographed him, and that was because it was a, a portrait project for college. And so it's just like you kind of shoot what's around you, don't you, um, or what's nearby in college. But what was lovely is that a couple of years ago, I went back to that gym and Charlie had, had died maybe a few years before that, but he was really well respected in the area. And there, there was a massive mural in the gym of my photograph that someone had painted it, spray painted it in the gym. So that's up there now. So it's just, it just shows the power of an image and what it can mean to people. And what, when I was able to tell them, actually, you know, that was me that shot that 15 years ago. It it gives you access, doesn't it? You're part of the you're part of that story or that community. So I started shooting in the boxing gym after that. That must have been a good feeling to see your your picture painted on a wall. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it was lovely. It was really lovely. Yeah. John, do you not have that as well in Bradford with your photograph of the the chap with the birds? Yeah, sorry, say that again, John. Do you have your picture of the guy with the birds on the wall in Bradford as well, don't you? That's right. That was done a couple of weeks ago. Oh, um, is that new? Sorry? Is that new? Is that just new? Yeah, it was a new commission. So the, the centre of Bradford is very depressed and everything. So there's been a commission. So they've got like four street art portraits up at the moment from... Uh, local characters one of them's in keithy that captain tom moore you know the guy who walked around his garden yeah because he was from keithley and then there's three in bradford city center 
grassroots characters, so not celebrities. So one of them is Barry, who I photographed, and they used that as the basis. It's from the of, pictures uh, that look beautiful. That yeah. Thank you. No worries. Um, cool. Sorry, I've lost my, my place here and what I was thinking about. Um, sorry, folks, I have a blank. Um, so, yeah, that's a good question from Alan. Um, how, now that you have infamy in the Govan Hill area and everybody knows you and wants you to take their pictures, does it make them act different when you approach them? Is there, is there a change in them or do you just wait with them enough time till they calm down and just get that moment? Yeah, um, I mean, I'm well known in Govan Hill, but not everybody knows me, you know, mm -hmm. and so it still comes as a surprise to people uh, for me to approach them and ask. Uh, some, some know who I am. Um, I don't think, no, people, usually I start with conversation. And so we just kind of fall into just a very relaxed mode. And it takes me a wee bit of time to set up the tripod. I, I really like lines straight, you know, my horizontals and my verticals. Are, <laughs> and so it takes me a wee bit of time to shift that. So while I'm doing that, we're having a conversation and then maybe there's a, just a little moment. Um, Another thing, something I noticed today for the first time actually was there's props in my photograph, which, you know, so we've got Paisley and she's got bubble gum. Um, we've got Danny and he's, he's holding a, a dog. We've got... Uh, that was my question that I wrote down while she was chatting before. Is like, how many dogs are actually in the project and is it more than humans? <laughs> so, I think I could do a, a magazine just in the dogs of Govan Hill. Or I reckon you should. Yeah, dogs of Govan Hill. Brilliant. And that's the thing, you know, so photographing people... It, it's like being in an exhibition. What do you do? Where do you put your hands? And um, so it's often when I'm in the street, maybe someone's standing smoking, it makes them dead easy to um, go up and talk to. And so they're comfortable smoking. Now, I don't deliberately want everybody smoking in my pictures. That's not my intention. But it's just if they are, they are and they're comfortable. Likewise, if they've got a dog, you know, they're happy to have it be photographed with their dog. So usually there's a conversation and there's just a little moment where the guard comes down or just things relax and that that's when I take the shot. Brilliant. And then um, Paul asked, um, do you ever get fed up of it? Take nah, it. nah. It's the best job yeah. in the world, isn't it? Oh, it is. Can you imagine? Oh, to be a photographer, that'd be brilliant. To get paid for it, that'd be, you know, no, it's, it's, no, I never get fed up with it. What I would say is, just talking about the fear, even though I've been doing this a long time, that comes back. And sometimes I'm just thinking if there's any students on just now that have tried to do similar things, maybe approach strangers and they get rejections. Um, keep going because I get that still, you know, sometimes people walk by and I'm not quite ready. I'm not quite in the zone and I've got to psych myself up to do that. And I think that's a constant and I think it always will be. And so whereas I never get fed up making images and the feeling that I get from getting a great portrait I'm just elated but there are moments where I really have to have a good word with myself and say what am I doing you know why am I doing it and and make myself do it mm -hmm. I think I'm um, just talking about that for you this is something I was meaning to bring up earlier actually so I'm glad you mentioned it um and I think it was in the the video of you um that will pop in a link just before the end I think would be useful in case anybody wants to go back and look at it um but you were talking about um the original image at the very beginning of this talk, the one in Paris of the lady yeah. at and um, how you thought at that time, oh, why I can't take her picture, I'm not a photographer. And it's like that fear as well and that kind of limitation that people set in themselves. At, at what point for you were you able to cross that line and think, actually, I am a photographer, I've got a camera, anybody with a camera is a photographer and I'm, I'm able to go and do this and just kind of throw yourself out there? Yeah, I mean, that was the moment where, where I decided I, I had paid, that was a lot of money for me to go to Paris, 50 quid, you know, at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm walking around and, and my pal was, I had left a job, a good job. I was a, I was a postman. I'd left that to become a photographer. So I had, inv I had already invested into this idea, into this career. Um, so I had, I had a responsibility to myself to make that work. When did I become a photographer? I don't really know. You know, are you a photographer right away just because you pick up a camera? No. Um, but I think at that moment, 
where I kind of crossed that boundary of fear and I realized that there's something special there, then I think that taught me one of the sort of core skills that you need to be a photographer. And then you just build and you just build and build on that. And then you're really only a professional photographer, I think, when you start doing it for a job, because that's what a profession is. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, I don't consider myself as a professional photographer. And that shocks people sometimes. Yeah. But it's it's not where I get my bread and butter. So maybe I'm just a hobbyist, um, but I've got high standards. <laughs> so. And um, see, like when you're in that moment, though, and you've decided you've done it and you're, you're going to be a photographer and things, but you're not making money, like how did you begin putting out your pictures in a way that were getting recognised and you could pick up jobs? Because um, obviously there is a bit of a mindset shift there, isn't there, like putting yourself forward for something that's all well and good being out in the street and having yeah. your own time and scope to do that, but to then be put willing to put yourself in a situation where someone's about to pay you to do something is, is quite different, isn't it? Yeah, I think for me, I mean, this is different for everybody, but I think actually getting employed as a photographer that was the first time I could say I was a photographer. Um, so when I worked for the newspapers, that was my job title. It was in my contract. So for me, you know, just like a postman, you know, that's my contract. It, that's when I was a photographer. Um, so I think that's quite hard for freelancers because as freelancers, you, most of us tend to do lots of different things to earn a living. And so which one are you? Um, and that's quite a hard thing to come to terms with. But I think for me personally, it was when I got a job in the newspapers, I felt like a photographer. And that's what all my, that was my commissions. That's what I was doing day to day. Uh, I still feel like a photographer, but I just don't really consider myself as a professional photographer because I'm not, it's my own rules now. Um, and maybe you could do that as a professional photographer. Of course you could, but yeah, it's just, it's just how I felt at the time. No, I think it's um, all valid points and things. I think it's uh, for folk, as you mentioned, if there are any students and stuff on, it is the most difficult transition, isn't it? I don't think there's anything less natural than believing in yourself in that way, isn't yeah. it? Really putting yourself yeah. out there. So it's uh, it's something we're definitely worth discussing. I think um, leaving college, sorry, John, I think see when you leave college as well, for, for anyone that's on, that's like the very beginning. It's almost like you've got to start over again and that's where you've got to find the drive because college becomes easy. Um, and you've got to, the minute you don't have it, then it becomes special and you've got to work for it. And at that time, I, I used my college to shape a portfolio so I could get my foot in the door of a newspaper and go up and show them that. And so you've just got to keep keep going, keep chapping. And I, I started photographing clubs as well, like you. That was one of my first paid jobs. And Dell's on tonight. Maybe uh, Del Boy, you're still here. And, and John, they used to come out with me. I used to go out with a writer, right? But sometimes the writer didn't turn up and I get my mates to write these stories for the papers, just going up to clubbers and asking them, you'd ask them a question. I don't know what question, they wrote it on me and I'd do the pictures and I'd get 75 pounds for that. Um, and we'd spend it in the same night, you know, but it was still, it's, you know, I had to do that and then a bit, I did that well, and then you get another chance, and you just keep pushing, keep pushing all the time. Got to keep chipping away. And I know that um, probably yourself now as a lecturer, and your lecturer Christine, many other people in education on here, like for students, like banging your gums and telling them to take the opportunities that they have at their fingertips at college is is just something that can't be underlined more, is it? And you don't listen when you're a student as well as you should, but from people who have been there definitely take advantage of it because when you leave you're on your Todd. <laughs> yeah I think it's the time as well John isn't it it's, yeah. it's you don't ever get as much time and you don't feel it at the time you think you've got deadlines but then you know it's it's like if I'm teaching a, say I'm teaching a, a unit called photojournalism right you'll have eight tasks to do so eight jobs but you've got three months to do it mm -hmm. you go into a newspaper you've got eight jobs in one day you know so it's the time that you get at college, absolutely just embrace it, throw yourself into it because that work could be the stepping stone. Don't throw your legs away. Oh, well, it's digital files. I can back up, back up your files. <laughs> yeah. So did you just bend those negatives? I meant to ask you that earlier as well. Did you just totally disregard them? Yeah. Yeah, we're moving house and just um just threw them. 
they, they probably weren't very good. It's a, probably a better story than, mm. you know, than the actual reality that there's good pictures on there. I've got said, maybe some. if you kept them and you'd looked at them and you thought, oh, they're a bit naff, you would have never continued with the project. So maybe, <laughs> maybe that is, it was fate. Um, Dylan um, has just asked uh, one final question here. In my last year at school and looking forward to studying at the City of Glasgow College, um, do you want to include colour in your photographs in the future? Uh, oh, that's a big, big um, question. Well, I shoot in colour. Um, you know, Govan Hill is the place if you want to shoot colour. Is the, sh the way the shops are painted, reds, yellows, greens. It's fantastic. Um, it's just that I'm that way. I started the project in black and white at college. And I've just got to continue it. But maybe there's another way I can look at it, another chapter. There will be colour photographs. Um, but I just like doing it this way. This is my, that's kind of my style in a way. How to call it that. People are starting to recognise, I think, how my images look. And I like the way they look. So I'm going to keep doing that, Dylan, for just now. But maybe one day, you never know. And it is frustrating sometimes, isn't it, as a photographer, but it is important to have a visual identity, isn't it? I think so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Nothing wrong with experimenting, especially, but but you get to know what you like and what works for you and what you're good at. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I do. Right. Well, listen, um, I don't want to keep uh, people on the whole week. I feel like we could chat forever, but um, thank you so much for joining us and for everybody staying with us um, and for coming tonight. Um, really appreciate it. And um, if you haven't, um, go over and uh, see the exhibition. Um, the work up there is brilliant and John's as well and those of other photographers. And um, yeah, just thanks for thanks for giving us your time tonight, Simon. Yeah, massive thanks to everybody for, for joining. I really appreciate that. Um, Loads of friends. I'm, I'm actually just looking through the gallery view just now. Loads of friends. Uh, loads of new friends. It's to me. So thanks everybody for joining. It was really nice just to have you. Thanks for the questions. Hope I, I hope I did, did it justice. Yeah, no, absolutely. And thanks for the questions as well. You made my life a lot easier. <laughs> now they think on my feet. So cheers for guys. I'll let you off. Okay. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.